<laughs> I forgot to hit record on the video. Oh, so this whole time you haven't been recording? Yeah, uh, that's no. all right. It's all right. Unplug back there. There we are. Um, all right, so so, so to, 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 to rewind what we were just talking about here. Are you recording now? Yes, sir. Um, so uh, we dropped this bed down to give us enough room. I probably still have to drop it down further at this point. But I dropped this way down. I then turned the switches off. That's one of the important parts. You need to make sure it's turned off before you unplug the Y-axis motor. And this was the plug for the Y-axis motor. It was plugged in right here. I unplugged it, let it dangle. I then go and get the rotary tool down here from, yes, over there, right? Uh, there are two different rotary tools that are there that are nearly identical. <coughs> the one for this machine, uh, this is the one with the motorized up and down, the one that's not currently dismantled, um, has a four-pin plug. The other one has a three-pin plug. So if you try to get it, the pins don't match, you grab the wrong one. Um, it does have labels to say what direct, what orientation you should have this thing. Um, also, uh, one thing that people often do is they don't remember to move this out this way before plugging in. So the tendency is to try to plug it in mm, with the wire over. coming around this side, but then you have to manually do this, and the wire is doing this whole thing. So usually, once you do that, you then have to unplug it and plug it back in again. Um, all right. So this is what's going to be rotating our glass around. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn the machine back on. And this is going to try to hold. Now, one thing about this, you'll notice these are spinning. But the gantry is not moving to the back like it usually should. Now, the gantry is trying to get back until it hits this proximity sensor. It will never find the proximity sensor because it's not actually moving. So you can either just let it go until it times out and just gives up. Or if you're impatient, you can take a bit of metal. Maybe it has to be ferrous. No, yeah, there it is. And just tap it against the proximity sensor. And it will say, oh, okay, I must have reached the back of the bed. <laughs> right? Makes sense. So uh, otherwise, I think it goes on for like a minute or something like that before it finally just gives up and says, nah, I can't find the back, so I'm just going to stop moving. All right. So at this point, if I move, if I hit the right and left arrow keys, it will move the head along the gantry. But if I hit the up and down arrow keys, it will, instead of moving the gantry, it will rotate the rollers. All right, that's what we want. <clears throat> so here is the trick with the rotary tool. We need to have this move back and forth more or less level to the surface that you're etching. But the pint glass is deep, right? So this gives us a number of different problems. First of all, when you're rotating this here, if you're just rotating this back and forth, there's the wobbliness in what's going on there mm -hmm. as it goes on. That's for a couple of reasons. One is that this is an exactly smooth surface and it's got this knurled or gnarled, knurls? Neural. knurls. Um, along here, man, I just keep on pulling threads loose on this little burr. I need to get a file and file that thing down. Yeah, that too. But, uh, yeah, I really, I, I do need to file that down. Um, so that is, yeah, now I'll just get my, now I'll just get my arm with it. Um, the other thing is that it tries to walk, basically. Um, oh, no, you, you, you don't have to do that. I, I, I can, I can get it in a little bit. Uh, the other thing is it tries to walk a little bit, because this is what it tries to do if it rolls. But it has these rollers that's, you know, trying to, so it's sort of like trying to move in a curved way. And that's part of what's making it bump and rattle. Okay. So we have created, I guess we've got two of them here, some, what do you call it? Some um, jigs for this thing. Now, uh, usually we used to actually have a little bit of bike inner tube that Al the cop would bring in for us that we'd wrap this in that would uh, come around to where the rubber actually sort of hits the glass a little bit. That holds this on a little firmer. Sometimes you'll get a glass where, due to the way it's shaped, this doesn't want to, like, stick on there as well. In this case, it seems to be sticking on there quite nicely. Okay. So we don't have to worry about it. Uh, we've got a couple of these made. If you ever come in and you can't find one of these, once you know how to use the, the laser, uh, these are very easy to make. You go ahead and take a calipers, which... If you don't have one, you probably should, being around the forge. Hmm? I've got some. Yeah, okay. So then you just take some calipers, measure, you know, the diameter right about, you know, here, 
and then you measure the diameter at the largest part, so right at the edge, and then maybe an inch in from the bottom. And then you cut a donut with one as the inner diameter and the other as the outer diameter, and you pretty much have your jig. Uh, we then like to put a little bit of like rubber band or inner tubing or something like that around the outside of it just so that it gets a little bit more friction in here. So whether you put it like this or like this is kind of up to you, and it really depends on how you set your art up on the software. Uh, I usually set it up this way myself. Okay. Now, do you see the problem here when it comes to keeping the surface in focus as this thing's going to go back and forth? Yes, it's not level. Right, it's not level. So the other part that we need to do is we need to jack up this end so that then this remains more or less level. So it's a bit of an eyeballing thing. People have tried to come up with jigs that will actually fit in here and keep everything straight, but generally I come in here and I just start finding flat stuff and putting it under here until this gets more or less flat. It looks like I need a little bit more under there. That's not quite it yet. Let's see. Might be too far. I'm get rid of this and replace it with this. Let's see if that's too much. And that looks pretty good, actually. So, um, once again, I haven't actually found the correct uh, measuring tool, which is, once again, supposed to be around here somewhere, but this looks pretty close. So, I'm going to go ahead and drop this bed a little bit again here until I get this in there. So, then I'm just going to go ahead and check it. So that looks pretty good there. Okay, so it's a little lower on this end, but by maybe just a fraction. And that's almost perfect on that end. So it's jacked up slightly higher than perfect, but for what we're doing here, that's going to be just fine. Okay. Uh, one thing about etching on glass is we're basically, we're actually shattering the surface of the glass um, at little pinpoints. Uh, we have heat differential. So we go ahead and hit a pinpoint of the glass with a massive amount of heat. Glass is terrible at conducting heat, and it's terrible at expansion and contraction, right? Or at least terrible at uneven expansion and contraction, which is the whole reason why you need Pyrex to put stuff, put glass in the oven and all that sort of stuff, right? So we are taking advantage of the fact that this is not Pyrex. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Pyrex probably would be too much of a differential even for Pyrex to deal with. But, um, or at least modern Pyrex. You know, they, they debased yeah. the formula of Pyrex a decade or so ago, right? Yeah. I didn't so, know. Um, yeah, my, my wife was very upset when I broke up a Pyrex lid or something like that. She's like, that's one of the old ones! <laughs> you know, I'm like, like, why did you not get a stool? I'm like, I didn't get a stool. Sometimes people drop things. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try to make sure this is lined up exactly on the ridge of the thing here. It doesn't matter that much. As long as this is per parallel to this, then if it weren't exactly on the ridge, what would really matter is whether or not this was the right distance at the point it is, right? So if you had this off a little bit, that's more or less fine, although you would get a little bit of distortion because of, you know, the angles of the glass here. So you want to have it as close to the top ridge as you can. Okay. So that's pretty much where it needs to be. Um, so, uh, we pretty much have this set up. Let's go ahead and look at the software and see what we need to do here. So, have you worked with any of this software before? No. Well, the, the Fusion 360 in that class that I took. Right. Um, that is a flavor of the same software that has been rebranded by Boss, and, uh, they've changed some of the way that it works. Okay. So, it's not exactly, um... It's not exactly the same thing. What's going on here? There we are. Um, it's not exactly the same thing, but it is going to be pretty similar. There are some things that are going to be very specific to what we're doing here, though, that, uh, to the rotary stuff we're going to need to get into. Okay. So let me make sure that we are logged in in the correct user here. Uh, you were here when I was talking a little bit to um, Clark about some of those issues. So if I say switch user, let me make sure we are in here in the admin. Let's say admin, yeah. So right now it's pew pew. We had that set up for when we had a different 
laser that was being run from the machine that had different software, and we were trying to get things set up correctly and didn't want people messing up our setups, and uh, it really doesn't have any reason to be that way. Um, all right, so I'm going to go to the RDWorks version 8 here. Open that software. Now, is RDWorks a uh, freeware? As far as I can tell, I think it's basically Chinese ch Chinese open source okay. or something like that. So you will find it under many names. You will find RDWorks, RDCAM, um, RDWorks, RDCAM. In this case, we have a copy that uh, apparently was one of the ones that Thunder Laser branded for its proprietary stuff that I guess someone downloaded from Thunder Laser's site. And, um, but it is not proprietary to Thunder Laser because you can use it for any of these things because they're all just the same software running the same circuit board, basically. So um, you'll find it any under any under any number of different names. But RDCAM, RDWorks, Thunder Laser, I've also Laser, LaserWorks, I've heard it called. So yeah, all the same thing. Um, the, the version that Boss did, they did more of a customization to the software than most people do. So there's a fair amount of, there, there, there's, there's enough learning curve that it sort of threw me for the first week or two I was using it uh, until I figured out, oh, okay, instead of looking for that here, I'm gonna look for that feature over here. And instead of doing this this way, I need to do it this way over here. So it, all the same stuff is there, but they changed the way that a lot of stuff is found. But most copies that you find are gonna be pretty much the same. Okay. Um, if you're talking, what were you thinking about downloading it yourself yeah, to be able to use it? Save um, time or the, the, not the, really? Absolutely, yeah. No, that's that's uh, that's not a bad idea. Make sure you get the right version number. Okay. That's what matters. Not whether it's branded as Thunder Laser or Laser Cam or you know whatever else, but that you get the correct version number. So in this case, what is the version number for this? Um, what is it? Edit. Under preferences, how would you find that? And once again, I'm not the PC guy, I'm more of a Mac guy, so, so I'm trying uh, to remember. go to vendor settings. Maybe mm, no. Think that's no, normally, yeah, <laughs> normally I, I would expect to see an about. No, no that's not it. Yeah, there should be. This is, um, I'm pretty sure this is a version 8. Dot something, but you have to make sure you get the right 8. Dot whatever, dot whatever, okay, uh, version in order for it to work correctly. Otherwise, it probably, oh, here we there go, yeah. about our decam. Um, there we go, 8.01.18. Okay, so just make sure, are you still recording there? Yeah. Okay, good. 8.01.18, no matter what the version, no matter what the name of the software is, if it's the same basic software, then if you have this version number, it should work okay. correctly. Uh, and I don't know if it has to be exactly the same version number, but I know it at least has to be 8. So this, I think, runs 6, and this runs 8, and they aren't cross-compatible right okay. now. Uh, we're talking about getting them set up on the same version at some point, but we're not there. All right, so at this point, you would do whatever um, design work you need to do here. Uh, generally, we encourage you to do your design work in some other software and bring it in okay. uh, for time reasons, and because this isn't really made to be design software. It is computer automated manufacturing software that has a surprisingly robust design package built into it but it's still not made to be design software. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Okay. So, um, so you know, if, if I need to do something like cut a new, you know, uh, focus stick, you know, that I could do here. You know, just go ahead and make a rectangle, you know, go ahead and say that rectangle needs to be, you know, oops, uh, 18 pixels tall, um, and, you know, however, uh, sorry, 18 millimeters, I should say. And, you know, like 100 millimeters long, and then I could just go ahead and zoom in here and then put a little hole for, you know, to be able to hang it from, and then go ahead and use some text and put some text in here to say what it is. You know, something simple like that, sure, go ahead and use this. Anything that's more complicated than that, um, do it in some other software. Personally, I tend to use Illustrator yep. for a lot of this stuff. Uh, I am starting to move over in certain ways, and many people here are generally gravitating towards Fusion 360 as a 3D design software. Um, lots of people like Inkscape because it's Inkscape. free. Uh, I'm not personally a fan of Inkscape. That's largely because I'm a Mac guy, and Inkscape on the Mac is kind of a massive pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you're using Inkscape, just make sure that 
uh, you know how to export everything as a DXF that will actually have all the visual information in it. Okay. Uh, and that usually involves having to take any objects and break them apart into paths, uh, not just text, but even shapes. Um, and then uh, that's one of the main things. And then there's some sort of fiddly thing about how you export the DXF, like what version of DXF it is, stuff like that. So um, that's one of the reasons I'm not a fan of it because it's a lot simpler for me to just do it all in Illustrator and save it as an Illustrator 8 file, and then it imports directly into here. So that's why I tend to go that way. Illustrator's Illustrator not a freeware, money. though. Yeah, I was Absolutely say, yeah. not. No, it costs money. Okay. <laughs> I think we have it at work. But, I, I, I'm a certified Adobe instructor uh, in various Adobe software, so I get an, uh, an education discount uh, on the Adobe suite, and so I have the whole Adobe suite. So gotcha. that's... You know, that's why I do that. We do have Adobe on a, we do have uh, the Adobe suite on a couple of the uh, computers over there as well. Okay. If you're, if that's the direction you want to go. But if you're already familiar with Inkscape, um, you might just want to learn the idiosyncrasies of getting Inkscape files onto here and well, go with it. If, if that's already where your learning curve is and it's free and you already have it, you know what you're doing with it, that might well be the easiest way for you to do it. Okay. Not the easiest way for me, but whatever way you do it, get your stuff created and then bring it in. Okay. Now you can bring in, um, vector files uh, for cutting or uh, or raster files for, um, you know, engraving things like uh, 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 photo etching and stuff like that. What's a uh, raster file? What extension would it be? Uh, raster is a collection of different kinds of files. It includes okay. JPEG, PNG, GIF, uh, PSD, uh, various things. I don't think this can import a PSD, but... Um, this can definitely import JPEG, PNG, and GIF, uh, and BMP, I believe. Um, but uh, you know, TIFF and Photoshop, and and you know, there are a number of other ones that also fall into that category. Essentially, a raster file is anything that is a grid of pixels, as opposed to points on a Cartesian plane that are connected with quadratic equations. Right. That's a vector graphic. Raster is the ones that are grids of pixels. Okay. So those are the two basic categories of visual files. So if you want to go ahead and cut along lines, you're generally going to bring in a vector file. Okay. If you want to, you know, uh, uh, etch something with grayscale in various ways, you're going to be bringing in a raster file. There are certain cases where you might be able to do either one or the other. If you're going and doing just a black and white engraved image, you can do that either with vector or raster in various ways. Okay. Okay. Uh, by the way, do you have a particular file that you were wanting to uh, put on the yes. thing? All right. Ah, okay. Well, let's do this then. It's a large jump drive. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to just a stick. I know. I couldn't find my stick, so sure. I was I like, ah, I got this here. Okay. So, let's see. Now you get all the viruses. No, exactly. <laughs> to take home with you a virus. Um, all right, so uh, let's say file import. Now, if you're bringing in a raster or vector file that you've created in other software, you're going to import it. Okay. If you have done work in here and saved that work from here that you then want to open and use again later, that instead is going to be open instead of import. Okay. And uh, I think it's a RLD file. RLD or RDL? Uh, probably RLD. Oh, RLD. Yes, right there. Right there. Yes. Um, RLD. There you go. So I'm going to import, and let's find your drive. Forge Greensboro. And Xmas Team Logos. Okay. Ah, yes. Razorbacks. My dad went to University of Arkansas. So. Now, I do have one question. So, yes. And we can use any one of these because sure. eventually I'm going to do all of them. Okay. Um, but I want to know... Is that one possible? Possible, difficult. Possible, difficult. Um, advanced. Okay. <laughs> um, there are several things about this that are going to be advanced. One is it's going to be difficult to know exactly how it's going to line up on the glass with all of this dead space in the raster image. Okay. And, and that's what's odd because I um, I actually removed the background on my phone, so it's right. supposed to have just saved them without the background. Well, apparently it didn't crop correctly somehow. Okay. So you, something zigged when it should have zagged, and it didn't get cropped. Okay. So I w I'm 
let's not do this one today. That's fine. That, that would be something. Here are two other things to keep in mind when you're going to do an image like this. One is that uh, when you etch onto glass like this, everything etch will turn up looking a little whitish. So for a photographic image like this, it might not be a bad idea to do a photo inverse. I saw uh, that's what Jesse did on mm -hmm. whatever we were doing engraving. Right. right, exactly. I don't remember how he did it, but that's fine. We'll uh, deal that's with that. something you might want to do in your photo editing program first okay. before bringing it in. Uh, but you would want to make sure that the background, once it's inversed, would be white. Okay. Right, because you don't want it to actually be etched. Right, you don't want a whole right. thing or whatever. This would all be white etched in the background. Um, so you would want to do a little bit of that manipulation beforehand. Okay. Um, there, I think there is a way you can do it in here. So when you come here and you want to edit a photographic image, you'd go to Handle. Um, where is it? Bitmap Handle. There we are. Uh, and yeah, there is an invert color right here. So if I say Apply to View, there we go. But that then makes all this black. Gotcha. Right. Uh, so a couple of other things to, I'm going to cancel. No, it engraves the black. You said not the white, correct? It engraves so the, the black, white. but it engraves it as white. Yeah. Right. Got it. Yes. Okay. Um, so a couple of other things to know about this. Um, well, if you're going to do photographic stuff and this applies to any situation, rotary or not, uh, generally, here's the best process I have found. There are other ways to do this, but this is my way I do this. And I, people pay me to engrave things on their boxes and stuff like that. So uh, I, I, this is what I would suggest. So bitmap handle, which you can either reach through this button here that says BMP or through the handle menu, uh, bitmap handle, right? They both open the same menu. Okay. Either one you click on gets you to the same menu. Um, so at that point, what I do is I say, I want to dither this image. And I want to dither it as a dot graphic. So if I then say apply to view, if I zoom in here, you'll see that it's now oh, that's cool. pixel pixelated it, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one thing you can do here is you can jack up the resolution which usually is not necessarily the smartest thing to do when you're working with uh, with rasterized images to just give it more pixels because it's not like it can find more visual image visual information than is actually there. But what it does do is because you're going from grayscale that has 256 shades of gray to just black and white, it gives more different black or white pixels available to define each gray. Makes sense. Right. So you can at least get sort of four different shades of gray in the same different area that was originally one pixel. Right. You know, one little bit of black, two bits of black, all this stuff. This gray that's showing up here is actually an optical illusion. That's not actually there. These are all being assigned either a black pixel or a white pixel. Okay. So what's going to happen is as the laser goes back and forth, it's going to be told, turn the laser on, off. On, off, on, off. As it hits each one of these black areas, it'll turn on. As it hits a white, it'll turn off. Okay. Um, a couple of things. So then um, one of the usual difficult things about this is finding the right sweet spot between speed and quality. Because uh, the power supply we have in here, being a you know one that we bought off of eBay or, you know, some, or Amazon or something like that to uh, upgrade the power supply, this isn't necessarily the world's fastest power supply. So how fast it can actually turn the laser on and off, uh, you know, if the faster you go, the less sure you can be that it's actually powering all the way up to, to full power for a pixel and then being able to shut off before it gets to the next pixel. Gotcha. So um, if you go anywhere above 150 pixels per second, or, sorry, millimeters per second in your, in your speed, you're going to be getting more sort of uh, sort of it sort of halfway turns on and halfway turns off, and you have sort of a little oval that's kind of sort of a pixel, but not really, and not all the way burned in. Okay. The other thing is when you're working on glass, it is much more difficult to be able to get any kind of differentiation between fully etched and a few spots that aren't etched your eye doesn't read that as well as a differential between this and this as it does on, say, wood. Okay. 
So what I have found is that generally, and once again, this is something you probably want to do in Photoshop or whatever your photo editing software is. It probably has a better you know, way of doing that, is to go ahead and make it brighter than you would think. Oops. Too bright. And then maybe up the contrast as well. Okay. So you would want to get it to where you can still see some detail in the faces. But, let's see. Okay, maybe I'm going too far with the brightness on this one. And it always differs from, from individual piece to individual piece. Well, there you can, you, I'm sure you could probably end up seeing some of the plaid pattern in the shirt. You would be able to make out sort of eyes, nose, kind of the goatee there. You can kind of see where her eyes and her facial structure is here. And that might work just fine. But you'll differential there, but maybe not. You know, some of this stuff in here will look a little mushy. Okay. Um, so on glass in particular, that can get a little bit dodgy. Um, okay. So this is this is advanced work. That's you cool. also it might also work better if you had a slightly higher resolution photo, although that might give you a um, false sense of the detail you're going to get in there. So maybe not. <laughs> this might actually be a good way to go. Okay. Um, so and then once again, though, you would want to invert the color as well as doing that, but then um, that might actually be, you know, but then you'd want to do it for this was actually white in the background here. Makes right? Sense. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's a bit of an advanced case. Okay. It's one of those things where if the image were a little closer, if I had time to go do something with it, that might be a nice little advanced uh, little, you know, thing to try to pull off here. But as it is, uh, let's go ahead and just do one of the more basic ones. And you problem. might be able to ruin a few glasses on your own, trying oh, yeah. this out on your own later. Hey, the glasses only end up costing about a buck sixty-six each, right? Yep. So, um, but people will be super impressed when they get them, right? Okay. So um, let's instead do one of the other simpler ones here. So I'm going to say file import, and uh, which Razorbacks you want let's me to do? do? The first do one. both of them. Okay. I'm going to end up doing one on each side of the glass. If okay, that's sure. possible. You, you can do that. It's um, All right, now, once again, all this extra room off the side, this can end up being a bit of a uh, a bit of an issue when it comes to making sure that things are lined up correctly on the glass. Um, but let's go ahead and try to work with this. Now, what we can potentially do yeah. is... Um, go ahead and do some... Photo editing? No. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. If we have PowerPoint. No, if we have okay. PowerPoint on Never mind. There, yeah. I was going to say, if we had PowerPoint, uh, right. I've got them pasted on PowerPoint, and then I saved it as a JPEG. I understand. So. I understand. <clears throat> uh, now, we'll go ahead and work with this as it is. Okay. Um, and once again, some of this texturizing here may or may not come through, uh, but we'll see what we can do. So uh, if you look at the way that the glass is oriented in there, what do you think we're going to need to do with the image here? Rotate it 90 degrees. Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and with this selected up here, Okay. say 90. And notice it says 90. Oh. It The arrow shows this way, but yeah. it actually moves that so way. 270. So, uh, so in this, well, now in this case, I'm just going to do 180 from where it currently is. There okay. we are. Um, and then, ooh, let's see. This is going to give me some problems there, perhaps. Let me, uh, how tall is this right now? Okay, so the diameter for these things is, I forget what the diameter is. It's, something, oh, it's somewhere around 300 millimeters. Okay. I, the, sorry, the circumference. I mean, the circumference is somewhere around 300. So yeah, the okay. diameter would be around 100. That's about right. Um, however, I found that, uh, a, and this can differ depending on these, what kind of image you're talking about. But I found that often I will try to limit uh, either dimension of the art to between 100 to 120 millimeters. Okay. Um, because if you're looking at something head on with the thing curving away, you know, theoretically, you might be able to go 180 degrees around. Once you get to 180 degrees, that's almost perpendicular to your vision, so you can't really see it. That keeps it within about a third of the arc of the glass. Okay. Now, with something like this, you might be able to go a little further around, but certainly if you have text, well, yeah, if you have text, you probably won't, that, won't want that to be much more than that. Okay. So, um, and then uh, when it comes to the height of the glass, uh, actually, let me see, is this, uh, let's see, here we go. 
I, I forget, that might actually be a little bit less, which is a little bit of an optical illusion. No, yeah, that can go up to almost 120 millimeters. But once again, I tend to keep it a little bit short of that because you don't want to yep. risk bumping it into that too much. So let's see, we are going to take this. See, but this tells me that it is, oh, 190 this way. Okay, so let's, uh, let me just shrink this down until I can fit on the bed and let's see what it says. So we're going to have to um, do, do some stuff to sort of uh, indirectly figure out what the size of this thing is. So I'm just going to draw myself a little bounding box around the art as we see it here and select that box and see what it says about the size. Oops. There we are. Uh, so that size is 122 tall, in other words, right to left in this case, but tall on the glass, and about 110 wide, uh, which is borderline. That we, we might be able to get away with that. It's a little bit large still. We'll, we'll so I'll shrink it down just a bit more. Um, let's see. So now at this point, if I take, can I take this thing? There we go. So let me once again sort of indirectly figure out the size of this thing here. Uh, let's see. Is that about right? That looks about right to me. All right, so in this case, it says it's about 110 this way and 101. So that's just about exactly the size that I'm going for. Okay. However, in this case, it still can be a little bit problematic in that it has this dead space up here. So we're going to have to kind of guess how, where we want the start point of the laser to be because it's going to want to start over here. Well, here's the other thing. See this green square? Yep. That's where the laser is going to start. And usually people have it set in the upper left-hand corner okay. because that's what we usually think in Western culture in terms of where the start point is on a piece of paper. However, in this case, it's going to be a lot, I'm going to make a lot more sense to us to either start at this corner or this corner. Okay. It doesn't really matter which one as long as we know which way we've rotated the glass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up to config system setting. Now, this is something that seems like a newbie shouldn't be messing with in any way, shape, or form. But you actually have to because sometimes people will move this and you need to know how to put it back. In this case, you need to be the one moving it. So see this thing that says laser head? Mm-hmm. This is where you can choose. This is going to be upper left, upper right, lower right, lower left, center, etc. We're going to put it in upper right. Now, when you're in here, do not mess with either of these. Okay. And here's what here's what I mean. If I were to accidentally just click it when I was right here, uh. right? I have had people who are no newcomers to the laser who have accidentally clicked here. And I know because of who used it beforehand and what it was doing right before these people were using it that they must have accidentally clicked this, gotcha. who had no idea they had clicked it, right? So just keep an eye on that. Okay. And it is weird. X-axis mirror, not checked. Axis Y mirror, checked. That's the way it's supposed to be, okay. oddly enough. Okay, so I'm going to close. That green box is now up here. So what that says <clears throat> is that that is the starting location of the laser. Okay. So I'm going to rotate this all the way to the top of the bed. So you notice this rotates this way, this rotates this way, and then it stops. Remember when I tapped the yep. um, proximity sensor with the metal? That means that it now thinks that this position for the glass is this thing being in the back of the bed. Okay. Okay. Um, now, one other thing that is very important that is only true on this machine, right? This machine has a different is programmed slightly differently. It has to do with the gear ratio on the rotary tool that you use on this one. Um, so the one on here, you don't have to take this next step. This one you do. Okay. Note this output tab. Yep. Down here, you'll see this has enable rotate engrave. It says circle pulse 8,000 diameter 22.6. I want to double check that and make sure those numbers are where they are right now because some of it they can get reset. It got reset a little while ago by accident. This is something that we have calculated in order to give us non-distorted images on here. For whatever reason, on this machine over here, it may have to do with the um, gear ratio on the uh, rotary engraver or something like that. That is, if not identical, at least close enough to the same distance traveled when, rota when rotating as when moving back and forth that we do not bother with this setting change over here. Okay. Okay. 
Um, it has the same setting you can set, but we don't bother with it because it's just not something we need to bother with. Okay. One thing you must remember, when you get done doing your rotary engraving, come back to the output tab, uncheck this. Otherwise, some people are going to be upset with you later. And it happens, right? If someone later is like, why is this thing acting all distorted? And you're on, you're on Slack, own up to it. I mean, we've all done it, you know, just, but try to remember to, uh, to undo that so that people don't get all bent out of shape. Okay, so we are close to ready to go here. Uh, we now need to just make sure this is lined up in the right place. So like I said, this is going to be a bit of an issue. How? Oh, right, we need to get rid of this rectangle too because we don't actually want that rectangle to be there. Now, about what is the distance between here and here? So, right? So I'm going to see, that says about 25 millimeters. So here's what I'm going to do to figure this out. These are millimeters down here. 25 millimeters is to about right there. So I'm going to move this so that actually I can't go any further. So what I need to do is I need to move this whole shebang down a little bit in order to be able to get this to do what I want it to do. And we'll have to make sure it's all still lined up correctly. All right. All right. So then what I want to do is line this up. There's the 25. Now, this is something you usually won't have to do if you've gotten things cropped correctly. But that looks like about 25 millimeters from the top. So that would mean that the very top of the Razorback here would be, um, would be at the lip of the glass, which is Probably not what we want. So I'm going to bring it in just slightly further. Um, okay, so once again, there we are. So there's not much of the art that comes up that high. So having it a little a little higher than I sometimes would, I think does make sense. It would just be a little bit coming up that high. And this is sort of an eyeballing thing we have to do at this point. Okay. So, uh, so next thing I'm going to do, you can, at this point, simply hit start. Okay. And it would set this thing running. Lid open, everything, right? And if you got the lid closed, that is a legitimate way of working. I have gotten in the habit lately, however, of instead saying download. Oops. Let's go back to the work layer. Here's one thing right here. The reason that said no layer for output, you notice right here this says this is a BMP layer, a bitmap layer. That is set to scan mode. The MP layers have to be scan mode. That means it's going to go zip, 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 and laser the whole thing on, as opposed to cut mode, which would be following a path. Okay. So for bitmaps or raster images, it has to be scan mode. But this output says no. That means it's essentially not going to send these instructions to the laser. So I'm just going to double click that there and change it to yes. There's some other settings we still have to set here. So I was about to jump on there, but there's some settings we have to do first. Sort of running out of power? Yep. Yeah. Um, so one thing is we have to go ahead and tell this bitmap, I'm still going to dither it, mainly because there's some of this stuff down in here. So I'm going to say dither. Uh, well, let's actually, let's see what happened if we said black and white. I'll say apply to view. That might work for this down here. So that might be something we would want to do. Otherwise, if I say dot graphic, apply to view, you get a little bit more. There's really not that much difference in here, but I think I'll stick with dot graphic. It's a little bit more of an attempt at grayscale in there. Okay, so I'm going to click OK. We're then going to go ahead and so I'm double clicking here, and that opens my layer parameters. So it's going to give me a speed of 350 millimeters per second with minimum maximum powers. I don't know who was doing this earlier. This is not the way I usually set things up. So for a raster image, I'm probably going to go for something more like 150 for my speed. Okay. Much faster than that, and you can get a little blurry with your uh, with your images. And then for raster images, I stay with the same minimum and maximum power. So in this case, I'll go ahead and say um, maybe about 30%. Uh, generally, with one of these machines here, I tend to go for something about... Uh, somewhere between the same, no, the same, the same number as this with zero knocked off to twice this number with, you know, so, so somewhere between 10 and 20%, uh, 
of this number here for the power percentage okay. um, as a rule. But, you know, you can play around with it. And on glass, it's less persnickety with that stuff because all it needs to do is just etch the surface. Okay. So um, none of these are relevant to what we're doing right now. The other thing we want... We want to make sure this is an X swing mode. What that means is that the head is going to be going back and forth while the rotary is slowly rotating things. If you had Y swing mode, the head would just be slowly moving while the rotary was zooming the, the glass back and forth. And you're going to get some travel in there with it going. Too much moment, angular momentum is going to come in and you'll end up getting a distorted image. That's so right. Do you have a question or just chill? Oh, okay. okay. So then uh, the other, the last thing we want to do in here is the interval. That is how far is it going to rotate things between each new line that it does. Uh, so it's somewhere between 0 .0, 0 0.08 to 0 0.12 is generally where we tend to go with that. So I'm going to stick with 0 0.1. That's probably going to be fine. So I'm going to click OK. Now we're just about ready to send it. So I'm going to hit download. Like I said, you can't hit start and it would just go from right now. Instead, I'm going to hit download. Okay. You can give it a custom name and then it would be saved in there for a while, but I usually just overwrite the default. So at that point, if we come up here and go to file, there is default. So if we say enter, there is a preview of what it is. Now, it's a little squished looking. That's because of the rotary engraved distortion that we put in there. That's because the gear ratio is different in there. And so it has to essentially distort the instructions that it's sending to then come out right with the gear ratio in this particular stepper motor. Okay. Um, so that is that you should notice that. And then if you're ever using this without the rotary and you see it squished like that, then you know somebody probably left the rotary engrave setting on. Okay. So I'm going to hit origin, which says that's the start point that I want this to start at. And now I'm going to hit, um, what's it called here? Frame. So this should give us an idea. Uh, actually, frame isn't really going to do us much good here because of the extra stuff on either side. Uh, let's give it a try. So I'll go ahead and hit frame. Oops, escape Y slop. Why do we have Y slop? Let me escape. So Y slop says that it thinks it needs too much distance in this way to do the whole image. But that does not seem right to me because we had it rolled all the way up to the top. And this should have room on here. Is it because so of the distance from here to here? It is shouldn't, thinking it this shouldn't is be. Way? It shouldn't be. But let me go ahead and do this. Let me put it up there. And then download again. Okay, so let's try this again. File, enter, all right, then origin, and let's try frame again, Y slop. Let's say enter and see what it does. Okay, that looks more or less right. I tell you what, I'm going to try running this with the laser switch off. So if you look here, my laser switch is currently off. Okay, so it's off. So now I'm going to hit start, and we're going to see how far down it comes before it starts zipping back and forth. Now it's probably going to give me a frame slop warning again here. I'm just going to say enter to go ahead and dismiss the frame slop. All right, so it goes all the way down to the bottom to start. That makes sense because you can see here a preview of what it's doing. That's where the Shauna or whatever it is, or whatever the name is oh. there, is starting to go. So let's see once it gets the whole height of the thing where it goes to. I usually don't go through quite this much, but because of the extra real estate around the image, I want to make sure this looks about right. So yeah, that's not going too low there, and so that's... The, the jowls of the uh, of the razor back there. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. So I just want to see when it gets to about the peak of it. This looks about like it's going to be about right, as far as I can see. I just want to get a little further. Since we 
can't be 100% sure about exactly where it's going up to there. All right, so that's the tip of the ear. And it comes down a little bit from there. I forgot we're looking at the tip. I'm looking at the red dot. Oh, it's starting to get right on the edge. But well, yeah, no, the that, lasers. Yeah, they're, they're, that, that, that's a terrible. <laughs> let's just do that where you can't really see where it is. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, that's really at the tip of the ear at this point, and the tip of the Razorback itself comes up just a little higher. I'm going to go ahead and call that in. Okay. So I'm going to hit pause and escape. All right. So now at this point, we're going to close. Oh, duh. <laughs> Third, right exactly where it's supposed to be, too. Just I'm feeling so stupid. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and move this over here just to make sure that the height is correct. It's looking pretty good, but it could be a little higher. Okay. Now, I didn't hit origin again. That means that same origin I had a second ago is still in there. So if I close this, make sure that the air assist is on to cool things down a little bit. Make sure the laser switch is now switched on. Remember, I turned it off to do the test. Laser switch is now on. Let's just do a visual check since it's been a while. Make sure the water cooler is on. And once again, the smoke evacuation doesn't matter for glass, but still out of habit. Okay. So I want you to do the honors and hit the start pause button. And it will, because remember, it thinks it's larger than it is. And it's probably also has to do with the distortion. That also is probably, it's probably distorted out taller than what it shows there. So that's probably where the problem is. But it should have enough room to go ahead and get it because it doesn't need to get down here to this lower part. So go ahead and um, hit enter to dismiss the frame slot. Usually, I try, I try to remember to hit preview first, which I didn't do. So it should take about six minutes. Yeah, that's probably why it's given us the frame slot, is because the rotary engrave uh, uh, distortion that it puts in there to make sure it comes out right essentially stretches this out this way. So hopefully, it's not stretching so far that it would cut this off. I don't think so, because I think it's about a one and a half times ratio. And if you did this one and a half times, it would probably come out to about right, right there. So hopefully this should come out okay. Fantastic. Um, now we're not good so do, far. So if this one comes out okay, we're just going to call that it. Oh, yeah, this one. Well, you can course. go do the rest yourself. <coughs> I appreciate you taking the time. I'll see it's a little after eight. Oh, yeah, right. I, I always run over with these things. But like I said, since you're the only one here, you know, this is, and this is why. You can see why I said I wouldn't, wasn't going to be doing the regular oh, yeah. orientation. Especially since most other people would already have done that, and that would be running over to the ground for them, and it would end up making us late. As it is, since it's just you, I figure, you know, me as well. And I appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, I don't know whether it might still be a good idea to show up tomorrow, but... Um, I'm going to. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to. Good. Same thing with recording. more times I get used to it. Absolutely. The quicker I learn. Yeah. That way I'm not screwing up a bunch of material or... Yeah. I said, did you buy yourself a whole case of these glasses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just like, what, 40 bucks for two oh, dozen, right? 25, 75 for two dozen. Whoa, is this? Yes. They've gone down? A dollar a glass. Last time, last time I bought them, they were 40 bucks for two, for two dozen. Yeah, they were sitting in a proper show. I wonder if it's like, uh, uh, you know, um, Black Friday weekend prices or something. Hmm. I don't know. I bought it today. Huh? Well, so we're on Tuesday. Tuesday. No, we're on Tuesday now, right. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, that's great to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it was it's it's twenty five seventy five plus so taxes. It's just about exactly a dollar. Just about exactly a yeah. dollar. Wow. Okay, that's uh, good to know. Absolutely good to know. So uh, it's looking you, really good. Good. When you get this done. Oh yeah. Oh, that's looking real nice. When you get this done, it is wise. To go out and get yourself some Scott Bright pads okay. and uh, scrub them down with dish soap and Scott Bright. Okay. Um, 
because what we're doing here is we're actually shattering the surface of the glass. That means there is micro, there are microscopic shards of glass all over the surface where it's been etched. Uh, and Microsoft, microscopic shards of glass and drinking utensil uh, don't go nicely together. So um, give it a good scrub with Scott Bright. Um, you know, really just Scott Bright and water should do it, but it's not a bad idea to go ahead and get some dish soap on it as well. And uh, you will definitely notice a difference in the texture. Uh, if you rub your finger over it when it comes out, you'll notice sort of a gritty, powdery, uh, sandy kind of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, texture. And uh, once you, um, once you Scott spread it down, it'll just sort of be kind of a, a ripply kind of texture instead. Um, so it'll take a lot of those, uh, a lot of those black shards out. Now, is there, if, if I wanted to do color on this, is there some type of paint or something that... That is a very good question. I've done some research on and have not found uh, satisfactory solutions. Okay. Um, there are some products out there that are advertised for doing that stuff, but they are not dishwasher safe, uh, which I'm the one who does the dishes in my house. If they're not dishwasher safe, they will just keep on going until the dishwasher ruins them. That's what we have in my house. So, um, that being said, there people have experimented with using Surmark on these things. Are you familiar with Surmark? No. That is what we use to mark metals. So, um, uh, well, there are two. There are a couple different ways to mark metal. Surmark is the uh, more expensive, higher end version of it, um, and it's the one that would probably have a better chance of giving you something on glass. So, what it is is um, when you're marking metal, you coat it with something that some substance has molybdenum. In it. We usually use dry molybdenum lubricant or dry moly lube. Um, but if you start searching for dry molly lube on the internet, I don't know if people are going to think that you are a drug dealer or a uh, pervert. But one way or the other, um, dry molly lube or dry molybdenum lubricant, lubricant. Uh, and you spray it on metal, and then you run the laser over it, and wherever the laser hits it, it chemically bonds the molybdenum to the underlying metal, which is lighter in color. So the molybdenum is darker, and so it gives a dark metal surface onto a light metal background. Um, and it's chemically bonded, so like it, you know, no matter how you scratch it, it's re you know, unless you literally are scratching metal off the surface, you can't get it off. So it's really nice. So um, Surmark, is, so dry molly lube generally runs about maybe ten bucks for a spray paint can size of it, um, and it gives you a decent thing. Surmark is a higher end product that costs maybe about eighty dollars for a spray paint can. And it has mixed in with the molybdenum. To my understanding, I think what it has is some sort of ceramic glaze that's also in there. So you're essentially like firing, you know, firing ceramics in a kiln. You're essentially firing pinpoints of this stuff with the laser. Uh, and that part becomes like a ceramic glaze on it. I have heard of some people experimenting with using Surmark on their glass and having that while it's etching the glass off, is also bonding some of this ceramic glaze onto the surface. Um, I don't know if the... I have not been encouraged enough with what I've seen about this online uh, to think that it's worth spending the money for Surmark to use for this process. But that's something you might want to look into. One of the sources that, uh, that both... Um, Jesse and I have used to get a lot of our expertise in the laser. Uh, there's a YouTube channel called, and I don't know why it's called this. It has nothing to do with the channel or the name of the guy who does it, but it's called Sarbar Multimedia. S-A-R-B-A-R -E Multimedia. And uh, this is a retired English engineer who um, his wife told him that in his retirement he was going to have to get a hobby or she was going to divorce him. So his hobby was he went out and bought one of these and then started doing a YouTube channel about how you use the software. But being an engineer, he has ended up ripping the thing apart and putting it back together again and sort of having a whole second career doing this stuff. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Remember I said, we said, oh, yeah. oh yeah, it cut off after the V and it thinks it's at the end. Okay. That's all right. um, so, 
Well, you know what? This is a good, a good piece. first go on this, yep. and I guess I may as well take it out. I mean, there's nothing, no enough extend space. I mean, there's, I can't just hit enter to keep going, right? Nope, I can't. Okay, that's fine. Sorry about that. Nope. Yes. Although it didn't say save or not this time. Um. So unfortunately, I've got some uh, glass edge cream. I can potentially just. Okay. Put it or, on there. Or you can just run this a second time. Like you said, these are a muck each. Exactly. So. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. I'm talking about so I don't even waste this glass. I can just etch right. the rest of that out. Um, so. Looks great. Good. Looks yeah, great. no, I, I like how that turned out. That, 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 that's really nice. So we're going to do that. So I can okay. start watching videos. So first of all, when you're doing the rotary stuff, Remember to come in here to the output and uncheck enable rotate and grain. That's going to make someone else's day much less miserable. The other thing you might want to do. Now let me ask you a question. So once you hit download and it sends it there and you start running, can you go ahead and change this back or is it? You absolutely can. Yes. Okay, so um, once, well, that's a good question because it's not obvious that it's that way. And there's certain setups uh, for certain other kinds of lasers and software where that isn't the case, where it's being run directly from the computer. Not in this case. There's actually a little mini computer in this that this is downloading to and it's running off of that little, um, it's called a Ruida controller. So the Ruida controller gets the uh, instructions, and from that point on, you can go ahead and start setting up your next job on here, wow. and you're good. Sweet. Uh, so that's a good question. So... Once again, run to the output and unchecked enable rotate and grave. That undoes the distortion that we need to make this come out right. The other thing is right now this green dot is in the upper right hand corner, which is not where most people expect it. Let's go back to config, system setting, and set this back to upper left. So you'll often find it at the center too. Both of those are pretty much the two most common places you'll find it left. Remember, do not mess with these. Double check to make sure that these are not checked, checked. And close. Okay, so those are the things you need to do to make sure the software is not going to trip somebody up next time. The other things you need to do, we're going to turn off the air assist. We're going to turn off the laser. We're going to turn off the main control switch. Now I'm going to turn it back on in a minute to raise the bed up because most people don't need it down this far, but I want to turn it off before unplugging this so that we don't short something out. So this goes back over here on the shelf. On the yeah, and these things are just things we use to shim stuff. Um, so then, before I turn it back on, we're going to take the y-axis controller and plug it back in. There is one little groove along here, so it will only fit in in one orientation. So if you don't figure out what that is, you might need to just sort of wiggle around until you find the right orientation for it to go in. There we are. I have no idea why this has four pins and the one over there has three pins. I don't know what extra information might be sent on that fourth pin. Who knows? So at this point, I'm going to turn this back on just so that I can hold the lifting platform button and raise this back up to a lift distance that is much closer to what most people are going to be using. Um, the other things that we're going to want to do, we're going to then turn this off once we're done. We're going to turn off the water chiller and we're going to turn off the smoke evacuation. And that'll be it. So you can go ahead and start switching those things off if you like. Here we go. And there we go. Now, if someone were using one of the other lasers, you wouldn't turn the smoke evacuation off, right? Because they would probably still be using that. Now, once this is going, what, does it run off the water chiller? It runs well? off the same water chiller. So we have one water chiller that chills both of these machines and another water chiller that chills this machine. Okay. Uh, because this thing has a tube that's about twice as powerful as either of these. So we have a T-splitter in here that just splits the water up between the two different tubes. Gotcha. Um, so with that thing being disassembled right now, whenever we turn the water chiller on here, it still has cold water being run through that tube. The same as it's being run through this tube. You can't turn one off without turning the other, turn one on without turning the other and one on the way we currently have it set up. Okay. So at that point, we then just hit the main power switch here and um, 
you're pretty much good to go. We've and set everything back the way it should be. Close the software out, or yeah, do we no, typically leave it open? It really doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and file be modified, save or not. <laughs> you got to love all of the uh, English for English by speakers of other languages <laughs> that are on here. So at that point, um, I don't know whether you want to uh, yep. dismount your hard drive and take it out or whether you want to go ahead and do a little bit more work here this evening before we leave. But um, you could. You, you could yep. go ahead and put it back. I mean, I just showed you how to undo.